Hello, everyone. Um, for our presentation, we are going to be talking about the book Teaching for Black Lives, and it's is presented by Ashley, myself, Morgan, Autumn, and Emily. So I'm doing the first part of our reading for this past week, which is pages 15 through 31. Um, my first slide is titled Black Students' Lives Matter. Um, this section of the reading really dives into the Black Lives Movement and um, the killings of Jordan Davis, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Renisha McBride, and unfortunately, many, many more. Um, the murders of the Black community is what ignited the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so I'll start off with a quote that says, in death, these Black youth shot down with impunity because of the color of their skin have provided a tragically thorough education about police brutality, institutional racism, and ignited the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, black students have played a pivotal role in this movement um, from college to high school, middle school, even elementary school students have staged protests, walkouts, have joined their communities and marches um, because black students, they take these risks because it really their future, their life, their education is all on the line. Um, and some of the things that black students have to face in the world today um, include police brutality, dismantling of their communities, gentrification, unemployment, poverty, and destruction of schools through corporate reform. The next slide is titled the School to Grave Pipeline, um, which is a series of interlocking policies such as whitewash curriculum, script, scripted curriculum, um, the neglection of struggles of people with color, the zero tolerance policy, racist suspension and expulsion policies, um, and also lots of high stake exams. Um, if we continue to practice this school to grave pipeline inside of our classrooms um, and within our curriculum at our school systems, then we are potentially setting these students up for a world of, fail of failure, which really depicts the ideology that was discussed in the book from classroom to cell block. Um, we as educators must correct the wrongs within this system if there shall be a change. The next slide is titled, Let Black Children Be Children. And I'll start off with a quote that says, overestimating the age, size, culpability of black children is a widespread phenomenon. Um, and another quote that I have reads, perceptions of, these, of the essential nature can be affected by race for black children. This means they can lose the protection afforded by assumed childhood innocence well before they become adults, um, which is a sad fact. Um, in the book, it reads black, black boys are viewed as more culpable and are viewed as adults at the young age of 13. They don't really even have the chance to be children because they are viewed as, like I said, more culpable, more violent, more dangerous um, and they are portrayed to be a lot older than they actually are. A uh, story I pulled, a real life example from the book is about Tamir Rice, who was just 12 years old when police showed up to Cleveland Park and shot him dead because he was playing with a toy gun. When his 14 year old sister ran to his dead body, police tackled and handcuffed her. The officer who called the report in classified Tamir, who was just a 12 year old boy, as a black male in his 20s. So his innocence was ripped away from him for something that was an innocent act of playing with a toy gun. And then they took that onto another level and described him as a black male in his 20s. So it is easy to see how their innocence is pulled away from them, their age is pulled away from them, um, and they're viewed to be a lot older and more dangerous than actually. So what can we do 
to make Black Lives Matter in our classroom, in our curriculum, within our school system. So the first thing would be to provide a social justice and anti-racist curriculum where teachers need to provide students with space to explore racism and police, police brutality, build a strong classroom community, build a strong level of trust within the classroom, and also have mutual respect and empathy from teachers to students. Um, the second thing would be support students who want to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement outside the classroom and settings such as clubs, forums, anything after school. And the third thing would be to raise the Black Lives Matter movement with other teacher educators. Um, so like I said, we talked about the school to grave pipeline. We need to change that and we need to build a school to justice pipeline. <laughs> So another thing we can do as future educators would be to educate the communities to support ethnic studies, replace zero tolerance with restorative justice practice, and also undo racial segregation that is reinforced by tracking. Jailing our minds. The no excuses approach to classroom management and teaching, which emerged in the 1990s, is a rigid and inflexible disciplinary system with severe punishments like suspension for minor infractions like talking in the hallway. During the 13-14 school year, No Excuses Charter School Strive Prep demonstrated a rate of 29 and a half out of school suspensions for every 100 students. It was argued that this approach can increase the academic performance of students of color, but it has actually overpunished black and brown youth. In 2011, more than 500 charter schools suspended Black students at least 10% more often than they suspended white students. Research has shown that harsh discipline in schools is more likely to cause students to end up in the juvenile justice system. In fact, more than one in seven students who was suspended or expelled came into contact with the juvenile justice system. In order to put a start to the end of the school to prison pipeline, we need not treat students like prisoners. Schools and the new Jim Crow. In Washington, DC, it is estimated that 75% of young black men will serve time in prison. The collapse of Jim Crow laws means that we cannot use race to justify discrimination, exclusion, and social contempt. We now have to use the classification of criminal to get away with it. It is perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals the way it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. This includes employment discrimination, housing discrimination, denial of voting rights, denial of educational opportunities, and denial of food stamps and public benefits. Children of incarcerated parents have to experience family separation, broken homes, poverty, and an overwhelming amount of hopelessness. They are highly likely to become incarcerated themselves, they are metaphorically born into a cage. Backlash of the civil rights movement manifested itself into a mass incarceration and the defunding of schools serving kids of color. Teachers can start by inspiring an awakening, educating their students on the presence of mass incarceration and allowing them to use creative outlets like poetry and music to express themselves and educate others. Racial justice is not a choice. The No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 is based on the idea that closing the race-based gaps in standardized test scores will achieve racial equality in education. However, standardized testing has failed at achieving this goal and has exacerbated racial inequality and worsened education for students of color. Over 100 years ago, standardized tests were used as weapons against communities of color, immigrants, and poor because they were used to prove that whites, rich and US born, were more intelligent. They used these scores as a reason to segregate students. Our educational system criminalizes test failure and punishes students, teachers, and schools, a form of retribution rather than trying to fix the problem. We can practice restorative justice by asking, who has been hurt and what are their needs? Who is obligated to address those needs? And who has a stake in the situation and how can we involve them to make things right and prevent future occurrences? However, this scope focuses only on the individual. 
we can practice transformative assessment by asking, what social circumstances produce the harmful behavior? What structures exist between this structure and others like it? And what measures could prevent further occurrences? I read how K through 12 schools push out black girls and Hania's story. Black girls account for one third of all female school-based arrests, but they only make up 16% of the female student population. Many girls who were interviewed experienced their first suspensions as early as kindergarten or first grade. Most of these girls recognize the importance of education, but unfortunately, they have already been victimized by a deeply rooted stereotypes that tend to put them into two categories, either good girls or ghetto girls. Hania's uh, story was a heartbreaking story. Her father was trapped in the broken criminal justice system, and she worries when she starts to see herself in him in that way. She sees the school to pipeline school to prison pipeline clearly when she says sometimes it feels like the education system is designed to set you up for failure and grooms you for a life in, of incarceration in order to combat these unconscious biases in the classroom teachers need to have robust conversations we need classrooms built on trust and we need implicit bias training we need classroom culture that reflects the norms of our students so they feel comfortable and safe in that space I also read Teaching Hanaya and Teaching the Prison Industrial Complex. So how do we teach students like Hanaya who have incarcerated loved ones? First, we need to break the silence. We need uh, to connect with them, whether this is through a personal connection, poems, um, readings, activities, to help these students feel accepted within our classroom space. We do not need to judge them in any way. We need to teach them as we would treat any other student. We need to let them know that they are worthy of success despite having a loved one being incarcerated. And we don't need to project any feelings that we have about incarcerated people onto that child. Hanaya found a safe space in beats, rhymes, and life. She was able to express herself through her music and had people to believe in her. We as teachers need to be able to offer this kind of support in our classrooms. So earlier, Morgan introduced a topic about replacing zero tolerance with restorative justice practices. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper on that topic and discuss what restorative justice looks like in the classroom and what it is not. Um, so the zero tolerance policy is when schools resort to extensive punishment measures such as suspension or expulsion to punish misbehavior. And this mainly affects students of color, LGBTQ, and disabled youth. Um, I put quotation marks around misbehavior because many educators perceive this as misbehaving, but most of these misbehaviors are very small and minor infractions, such as talking in the hallway, going against the dress code, dyeing your hair, wearing the wrong shoes on test day, and even wearing fake nails. Um, and the book says that we should leave these extensive punishments and instead we should address the root of student misbehavior and have the willingness to rethink and rework our classroom schools and school districts. So what does restorative justice look like in the classroom? So I tried to find a illustration that was similar to the one in the book. Um, and if you look here, the, the kids and the teachers, they're all in like a circle. And so some things that should be done in the classroom is building healthy relationships, promoting trust and unity, um, providing support for students return to the classroom after suspension or expulsion, um, and reminding children of their goodness and worth after they have done something wrong. And two important things that are required in order for sorts of justice to be effective is school-wide and district-wide participation and a lot of funding. Um, and the book mentions a few examples of what it could look like in the classroom. One example is a high school boy is returning from being incarcerated and to prepare for his return, the teacher gets um, his parents and his fellow classmates all in a circle and they 
do three rounds. In the first round, everyone says what they as children hope for in adulthood. The second round is they speak their values. And in the third round, everyone shares what they commit to doing for the student who is returning. And when the student returns and they share this to him, at first he said that he didn't, he wasn't sure if he could trust his classmates. But after this restorative justice discussion, he felt very welcomed and just really encouraged. And another example, was when two boys um, got into a fight and they each got suspended and while they were away um, the teacher had a discussion with the with his classmates and they discussed what they could do for the two boys to make them feel welcomed when they return and he decided to have each of the classmates say good things that each boy has done in their life and they shared that to each of the boys when they returned and um, when the two boys who fought each other when they met each other. They also said compliments to each other and after that they ended up being really good friends. And another example was when a group of students went up to their teacher and they explained that the way she was teaching slavery was hurting them and it made them feel terrible. And so they did a restorative justice discussion and after that um, the teacher actively listened and she changed her lesson plan and she still uses that lesson plan um, today. So what is not restorative justice? So restorative justice is not a set of prompts. Um, for example, in school when we're given a writing prompt, we have to follow the exact requirements in order to receive full credit. Um, but for restorative justice practices, there's no set rules where you have to do the same exact practice for each child because each child has their own concerns, they have their own feelings, and so you should really base it off of their own feelings and their concerns. Um, and it is not a quick fix or a temporary practice just to change suspension, suspension statistics. Um, it should be the new normal. Um, and the book calls it restorative-ish practices that we shouldn't be doing. Um, for example, having students wipe cafeteria tables in place of suspension, that is not practicing restorative justice. And just renaming your program restorative just because of its positive connotation is also not practicing restorative justice. Um, you shouldn't just use that to cover up the program that is actually harmful. Uh, that is the end of our presentation. Two questions that we wanted to discuss was what can we do to promote trust and unity within the classroom and how can educators create lessons and assessment in the interest of justice? Thank you.